Hello and welcome to the first day of MD and DI's Focus on Fundamentals course, Medical Device and Pharmaceutical Testing, Regulatory Updates, Trends and Anticipated Changes, including FDA, ISO, USP, and MDRs, sponsored by Nelson Laboratories. I'm Chris Keach and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn more about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during our Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but if we're not able to get to your question today, someone will be getting back to you via email. The slides will also advance automatically throughout the event, and you may download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our, our short survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a, mo a moment to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. And lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click on the help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to today's class. Assessing Biocompatibility for Medical Devices, Updates, Trends, and Anticipated Changes. Discussing today's topic from Nelson Laboratories is Thor Rollins, Director, Toxicology and ENL, and Matthew Jorgensen, Chemistry and Materials Scientist. To learn more about our speakers, please visit the BIOS widget. With great pleasure, I now turn this special session over to Thor to begin. Thor? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, I do want to say before we start that um, there's no way that we're going to be able to cover all the proposed changes or impacts that could be coming down the line for unique medical devices. Um, but if you do have questions, uh, kind of like Chris said, make sure to put those in the Q&A tab at the bottom. And even if we can't get to those questions in this time, Matt or I would be happy to address those later to make sure we get those uh, questions answered. <clears throat> but the whole theme of today's webinar is revolving around the year of change in biocompatibility. And <clears throat> when I say year, I mean really the last couple of years, we've seen a big switch on how regulatory agencies uh, are evaluating biocompatibility. I, I've been doing biocompatibility now for 15 years, and in those 15 years, I've really seen um, ebbs and flows of how this, this uh, you know, group or medical devices has been regulated. When I first started in medical device um, work, we saw that regulation was uh, very much material dependent. For example, if it was a stainless steel or titanium or something like that, you could basically just say that that's the material and kind of move on. Um, but we started realizing in, that it wasn't just materials that are part of the risk of medical devices. In fact, most of the time the materials, I, in my opinion, have a lower risk for safety because we're all using very similar materials sourced from very similar vendors. Where I see most of the concern um, and, and where we'd like to evaluate a lot of our risk is with residuals from the processing of these medical devices, uh, oils or, or detergents or uh, just unknown things that are left behind either from you or one of the suppliers of your materials in that manufacturing process. So because of this concern, we've uh, kind of gone into a, a checkbox mentality, and now we're going from that checkbox mentality to much more of a risk-based approach, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But to kind of hit what the changes recently have we've, we've had, the, these are the three documents that we have seen um, and are continuing to see to be updated for biocompatibility. The, the first one is the FDA guidance document that was released last year in June. Um, and I, I really believe that this FDA guidance document is a really well-written and thought-through uh, risk evaluation for medical devices. I would highly recommend, especially if you're considering submitting any results to the FDA, that you really get to know this document as it does represent the current thought process of, of the FDA. But, re, but also, in, in, um, also, except for the FDA document, we're seeing big changes in the ISO 
uh, which we're, we're going to be talking about today. And these changes are just not changes that have recently happened, but are currently happen and currently happening and are going to happen in the future. And we're going to kind of talk as much as we can about um, what changes are happening in the ISO level. But then also we've seen this huge change in uh, Europe with the new MDR regulations coming out. Um, and how we're starting to see notifi notified bodies enforce these regulations because they're starting to feel a lot of pressure on, on um, their side, and so they're passing that pressure on. So really what this means is we're starting to get a whole lot of different approaches on how biocompatibility is being assessed, and in my opinion, it's the correct way to assess biocompatibility. I really like the approach that the industry is taking. Um, but we're going to kind of hit each one of those today to kind of get an overall sense in the limited time we have. Just for your information, these are the links for the FDA guidance document and then also the uh, MDRs that uh, are recently came out. So this slide kind of encompasses the overall view of the approach that we take currently take for biocompatibility, which is that risk-based approach. Um, I always joke that in, in my presentations that if uh, you want to make a drinking game out of this, if you want to take a shot every time one of us says risks, then none of us are going to walk away from this presentation. So, because it's, it's, that's really what this is. It's a risk evaluation. And starting this off, and we'll go through each one of these at a very high level, is we have to develop a biological evaluation plan at the beginning of this process. No longer can you just use the chart in ISO 10.9.3 to evaluate those risks. You really have to evaluate the risk by your individual device. So looking at the materials, looking at the processing, look at how it's used in the industry, um, their history with these materials and processes, and, and really evaluate the risk on an individual device um, uh, portion. And then once that plan is developed and that plan goes through all that risk evaluation, then we move into what is needed to feel, mitigate that risk. It is possible, although it is hard to do, but it is possible to meet all the risks in that initial plan with some justifications. But most of the time, we don't have sufficient information about the materials and processing of a medical device to meet, mitigate all the risks that that medical device poses. So we do have to fill in gaps from that, that initial plan with testing and assessments. Um, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what we're meaning with tests and assessments here in a minute. But there, this is what the plan pushes. What, what are those risks that we can't identify or, or mitigate? And then what testing can we do to make us feel better about those risks? Once we get the results back from the tests, we really need to do a biological evaluation report uh, or some kind of report that ties together the initial risk of that medical device the, the testing and the results that we got to come together with a conclusion statements that helps us feel good about the, the, the safety of the medical device. So, and I've used this example before, so if you've heard one of my webinars or seminars, I apologize, but I really think it's the best way to kind of explain what we're looking for. And we're still seeing the checkbox, checkbox mentality that, that has been, you know, in the industry for the last, you know, five or six years where people would just look at the ISO 10993 table, determine what the, the contact of the, the medical device is, and then it would just do what testing is required for that medical device, just checkbox. And that just doesn't work anymore. Medical devices are getting much more complicated, much more unique, and so unique evaluation is needed. So no longer, and the problem with that pass approach is you never really had to understand the materials and the processing that you're putting into that medical device. All you had to do was pass some antiquated test that we've been running for 40 years and hope that it, that kind of screens for safety. Um, and it really took all the responsibility off the manufacturer's shoulders on what is going into these devices, what are the residuals of these devices. So knowledge was not needed as long as you pass the test. So, I use my car example for this. In the past, that past approach, so that on the left there, that's my very first car. It's a 1967 Mustang. I absolutely love that car. But um, I wouldn't call that car very efficient. Um, it uh, didn't get great gas mileage. In fact, I think I got about six miles per gallon most of the time um, because it literally dripped gas out of the tailpipe of the car. 
Um, the steering wheel was as big as a bus, and uh, the brakes were really, really bad. You had to really plan out your route on how to stop uh, just to make sure you could stop in time. And as much as I loved that car, it really isn't that efficient, especially compared to cars today, like on the right. Cars today are much more efficient both in, in fuel economy, comfortability, and everything else that we uh, associate with new vehicles. The reason I put this car out here, though, the 67 Mustang, is that actually is newer than a lot of the test methods we're currently using for medical devices. Uh, a lot of these test methods were developed back in the 50s and 60s and before. Um, but yet, somehow, we're still using the, trying to use that old car where we have much better approaches that are more efficient and actually safer than just crossing our fingers and hoping it, it passes some you know, antiquated test. So that being said, that's where the risk assessment comes in. This risk-based approach is the new version of, of biocompatibility, one that we should all endeavor to, to take on. So I also want to kind of um, talk a little bit about an important part of this new approach, which is this risk assessment, the toxicology risk assessment, but also that material and chemical characterization. So this is the approach, that, the, the timelines that we should take when we're looking at biocompatibility, which is that initial risk assessment, then looking to do if we can fill in any risks with materials and chemical characterization, which are different, by the way. Uh, a chemical characterization is just a component of material characterization. There's other things that go into material characterization besides this chemistry. Um, and then ultimately, if we still can't fill in the gaps with those endpoints, that's when we need to do biocomp only if necessary. So um, that's our current approach as we are looking going into the future. But this isn't something that should be new. Uh, some, of, some companies, most companies, honestly, that I've worked with recently, it's new in trying to get it to implement into their systems. But if you look at ISO 1093 currently stated, it's still about risk-based approach. If you look at how it's written, especially Dash 1, and, and the guidance, it, it really has you evaluate medical devices within that risk management process. It's just we, we haven't done a great job of implementing this. And honestly, I think it puts uh, regulatory agencies at a, at a hard spot when they feel like there's not been sufficient uh, risk management by just looking at testing only by checkbox mentality. So, and I also wanted to hit home, this is the uh, part of that new guidance document from the FDA. If you don't think the FDA is going to want to see a risk-based approach, if you think they're relying solely on a checkbox mentality, then you haven't spent the time to read this guidance document. Even in that guidance document itself, as stated here below the, the title, it is all about a risk-based approach. And in there, they actually want to step away from the checkbox mentality and they really want you to look at potential risks of uh, the biocompatibility perspective. And if it's limited and you can evaluate the risk through material and process um, justifications, then there are ways we can do limited biocompatibility testing because th those risks have been mitigated in other ways. So what is risk? Um, um, I, I got this slide from a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Rivardi, and uh, he, um, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with ISO 14971, this is another one, even though uh, I don't think reading any ISO document I would consider fun reading, um, it is something that I would recommend you to spend some time getting to know because the new ISO is going to rely highly on this document um, and going forward. But the, the definition of risk is the combination of the probability of occurrence of that harm and the severity of that harm. I have seen clients of mine actually make the traditional risk-based chart for their medical devices, where they look at the risks of these devices, what could happen if failures occur, what could happen if, uh, you know, with these unknown materials or whatever, and then they do a risk chart where they look at the probability of that risk happening, especially with failures, um, and then the severity of that, and that helps determine their biological approach, uh, their biocompatibility approach based on their, uh, where that risk is associated. So this is a portion of the flow chart out of ISO 1093-1. And the reason I put this in here is because I feel like it's a really good flow chart to be able to walk through when you're doing your initial evaluations of risks. 
Because there are questions in here that you should be asking yourself at the beginning of your BEP, which is, what are these materials? What are the processing? Have I done these materials before with current devices and similar applications? Um, am I, do I have familiarity with the processing? All these kind of questions you should be able to go through to evaluate the, the risk of your medical device. And if you look at this flow chart, there's ways to exit this flow chart before you do testing um, you know, in, in multiple places. It's not until the third row that you actually see recommendation to perform biological testing. So you really need to start looking at the biological tests as a way to mitigate when you don't, you cannot fill in any of these gaps um, beforehand. So we talked a lot about material evaluation. What does that really entail? What are some things that we really want to evaluate with materials? Well, first thing you need to ask yourself is these are, new, are these new materials. Now, I, I want to be careful here because most of the questions that we have heard of in, in our experience here at Nelson Labs, and I'm sure most regulatory and, and CROs will tell you the same thing, which is, Man, this is stainless steel, everybody uses stainless steel, or this is silicone, everybody uses silicone. Hey, it has a master file with the FDA. Um, you know, why do we have to test this material? Because everybody has tested it before. I, I want to tell you that not all silicones are the same. Not all plastics are the same. Even if it's HDPE, not HD, all HDPEs are going to have the same constituents to them as others. So just because your predicate device has HDPE um, and you're using the same material does not mean that that just checkboxes your material assessment. So if you're using a new material that you have not currently used before, that's where a gap in your material assessment needs to happen, and you need to fill it in with either chemistry or biological testing. But if you are using materials that you've used before in the same application, then we can leverage that use in your risk assessment. If you're sourcing it from the same supplier, if it's going through the same processing, then that really helps uh, leverage that risk. You still have to look at material interactions. Um, you know, there are some very um, unique synergies that can happen between materials that are not greatly understood in some cases, but I'll send one out there that we do understand. It's, it has to do with metals, more with cytotoxicity. There are certain, there's quite a bit of metals actually that has cytotoxic potential, silver, copper, zinc, or some would just throw out there. Um, and most of these have very similar types of toxicological endpoints on these cells. So if you have uh, copper at a very low level, you may not have a, a response, but by adding another metal like zinc to the device, um, you may now have a response with a, with, a, with a coupling of those two metals. So you, have to, you do have to look at metal or material interactions. Um, and, and combination products, if you're doing a drug, uh, if you're adding a drug to a material, what does that drug do to that material? What does that material do to that drug? Um, those are questions. So you really need to evaluate the drug on its own, the materials on its own, and then with the combination of those two together. When we talk about your product too, certain tests or certain biological endpoints in the body, geometry does play a role, specifically in implantation impact and hemocompatibility implant, uh, impact. Those two specifically have a, a big, um, but geometry can play a role. So even if you're using the same materials as, as a device you used previously, but you're changing its geometry, you should look at the risk of uh, tissue interaction or of hemocompatibility if those are potential implants, uh, impacts from the device. Um, so, and then failure modes. You need to look at additional exposures from a device where like a balloon may burst or something along those lines. So these are things that you have to understand from a material in your initial BEP. Then, if you can't understand, if you don't have a lot of information from materials, then one thing we can do is a toxicological assessment within those. Um, we also talk about colors, and if, and if we don't have time, I, I, I've done a webinar before on colors. The FDA in February uh, the, did a, an amazing webinar on how they evaluate colors and when it's needed or not. You can find that on the FDA website. I highly recommend, but if you are adding colors or changing colors, you need to understand the impact from a safety an, um, aspect on that color. So the first step of biocompatibility is this material or chemical characterization. That's really the thing you need to start off with your, in your plan to understand the risks. 
what does this material characterization really involve? And I want to kind of, so we, take, we think of biocompatibility as the finished final device, and that's true. When you're looking at the risk of the patient, you need to look at it as finished, final, sterilized, packaged form, because all those can add risks. But when you're doing a material of, uh, characterization, sometimes and often, we want to look at the impact of the material directly. The reason I recommend this is because in the future, if you end up using that material for another device, or if you end up changing that material, then we have an, an evaluation on that material directly, and not as it is through processing that you may not replicate and things like that. So it does depend on your individual company's needs, but remember that material characterization can be done on just the material and not on the final finished product, but your ultimate biocompatibility assessment needs to be on a final finished form. The main hurdle we see with material assessments is communication with the suppliers. Um, this is turned into, uh, <laughs> sometimes can turn into a, a big pain with us um, because suppliers tend to try to give as little information to you as possible as manufacturers. Um, sometimes they just give an MSDS. I hate to break someone's heart about someone who really loves MSDSs, but they're not that great of information, especially when you're doing a material risk assessment. You can't just give a regulator, regulator an MSDS and say, there, my material assessment's done. Um, that's, that's not a material assessment. So you really need to have communication with your suppliers. Um, and my experience that is that they tend to be more cooperative when you're trying to set up some kind of um, uh, contract with them, and they don't already have your business. If once they have your business, they tend to be less cooperative. So when you're looking at setting up a supplier, there are, this should be in your mind, getting the information that you need on a component uh, level. So what are some things you need to ask with these relationships uh, to, to ensure that you have a decent material characterization? The first thing is you really want to have full disclosure of the material. I mean, that's your ultimate goal. And when I say full disclosure, you really need to know the components and the proportions of that material. What is in there? What is the uh, possibility of leaching out? What's the, the processing they go through? You need to understand that, that information. This is best set up with manufacturing agreements at the beginning um, uh, and composition disclosures. I do have MSDS on that list, list and, but that's the one I least like. Um, processing, I talked about processing and residual chemical um, disclosures. And I want to spend just a moment talking about device master files. <clears throat> Some of you, if you're not sure what a device master file is, let's say I am a manufacturer of raw silicone. And I want to uh, prove to the medical device industry that my silicone is going to be a good, safe material. I do some initial testing, um, and it may even be the total suite of biocompatibility tests that are required for a certain medical device. I take those tests and I submit them to the FDA, and the FDA reviewers them. Uh, once they approve of the work done, they give me a master file number for that material. Now I can give you a master file saying, uh, or a master file number saying the FDA has approved this material, or they don't approve individual materials, but the FDA screened this material and they give me this master file for safety. That is great. It's a great thing to have, but you really need to understand what's included in that master file. Um, so you just don't get a master file number. You really need to understand what testing is included because sometimes they can do limited testing specifically based off the risk of your device. Also, remember that most of the time, there are a few exceptions I've seen, but most of the time that testing is done on unsterilized, unprocessed material. So that is not going to be just a and all that says, right now we have a material that that has this master file, so I don't have to do any testing on it. Because remember, biocompatibility is not on raw materials. It's on a finished final device. So you're going to sterilize it possibly, you're going to package it, you're going to clean it, you're going to mold it. Whatever you're going to do can impact that biocompatibility. So the device master file helps you with the initial risk of that material potentially, depending on what tests are in there, but it will not end your biocompatibility assessment. So 
now we've talked a little bit about uh, materials and how to get some material pass. I'm going to turn the phone over to Dr. Jorgensen. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about some up-and-coming uh, testing revolving gas path devices. Thanks, Thor. And, you know, the, Thor was just mentioning the limited utility of these MSDSs on his, on his previous slide, and I had a thought on that. And the thought was is that if you're approaching an MSDS to look for good information, you know, you might kind of like set it aside and take a look at a great new resource that's online. It's called the Chemistry Dashboard from the, the EPA. So it can uh, really provide a lot of great information on uh, materials and uh, specific compounds within materials uh, that, that can be really useful. So on the, with these gas path, uh, path devices I wanted to mention, there's a new standard. It's ISO 18562. And I was really excited that this standard came out because with respect to respiratory contact devices, uh, we were seeing that the ISO 10993 series of uh, standards really weren't fitting these respiratory contact devices very well. And there were some misconceptions in the industry of whether or not uh, these gas path devices even needed to do biocompatibility testing because uh, you know, because they, people might argue that, oh, well, they don't really contact the body, but, but they do. It's external communicating. It contacts it through the, through the gas. So um, ISO 18562 was, uh, was made to address this issue. It came uh, in its final form uh, just this year in, in March. The, the beauty about this series, is the, there's four parts to it. The, the beauty is that it really takes a risk-based approach to gas path devices. And it narrows down the, the potential risk from these devices to, to really three categories. There's volatiles that the device could release that the, the user could be exposed to, or there could uh, be particulates that are released by the device that could, uh, could be a concern. And finally, if, uh, if it's a gas path device that has the potential to form like, condensate on the inside of the device, this liquid could be contacting the materials, and then uh, that could then uh, be transferred directly to the, the, the patient in its liquid form. So it addresses all of those risks with a really clear um, uh, risk-based approach. And the way that this is done, to do the, the volatiles and the, the particulates, it, it's basically a common sense approach. So you think about how the device is used clinically. You take a, a worst case approach where you say, okay, this is the hottest temperature the device could run at, and this is the longest time, and you try to sample the device, the gas that passes through the device, into a canister, and then you analyze any uh, compounds that, that were inside the, the canister. So I think it makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a really great approach. For the particulates, there's a couple of different ways that this can be addressed uh, analytically. There's a really common... Um, a method for measuring particulates that's uh, you know more, more often used in the environmental industry, but um, basically you you run the device again in worst case and direct all of the output output through a filter, and you can measure the filter by mass and determine if there's any particulates that are that are coming in there. For uh, the the condensate. That can be captured with extractable leachables, chemistry testing. I didn't really want to put some slides on ENL in this presentation because this is about everything that's new. And ENL, uh, extractable leachables, chemistry testing has really become more um, mainstream over the past few years. So once you have all of these results, the, the volatiles and particulates, if it's uh, a device where condensation is possible, you have your extractable leachables chemistry results. These all get summarized into uh, a report, and it, you know, really the results of chemistry testing are like what you see on the, the left there, where you could have a long list of compounds and uh, how much is, is in the device. We're seeing more and more now that when folks do chemistry testing, uh, the quality of the results can, can vary pretty widely. So for example, sometimes all of the concentrations are just estimates. Other times, they're really rigorously validated, fully quantitative results. We're seeing the FDA more and more really want to see this fully quantitative uh, analytical results. Once you get those results, then there comes a, a very critical step is, you know, what do those numbers mean? And that's where uh, experts like, uh, like Thor come in.
where they can really understand what all of those numbers mean and translate that into a potential risk to a user. So I, I'm going to go ahead and transfer this back over to Thor. He's going to talk about how these results are interpreted, interpreted to uh, understand the risk of the device to, to the potential user. Okay, here's Thor. Thank you, Matthew. And I, I do want to say that um, we talked about new and upcoming uh, biocompatibility concerns. This gas pass standard is new in the industry. It's something that is starting to be enforced uh, from all regulatory authorities. Uh, we're seeing a big push for this, and so we wanted to make people aware if you fit into that category. But really, the results are evaluated just like any other medical device toxicological assessment, the, the only difference is you have to look at the route of administration, which isn't a difference, but um, most devices aren't meant to be in, inhaled. Uh, in this case, the compounds uh, will have an inhalation endpoint, and so the toxicology assessment needs to be evaluated for that endpoint. But once you have those evaluations, then you can really determine the safety. And the reason I also really love this approach from, for inhalation devices it's, it's clinically relevant. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to treat them like an implant uh, in, in a vascular implant, for example, because it's just uh, not clinically relevant to the use of the device. So uh, if, you, if you do have an inhalation device and um, you know, maybe you haven't seen this yet, you will see it, uh, but read the standard, uh, get the standard and read it. Um, and if you need any help, uh, obviously let us know. Okay, so now we're going to get into more of the how to assess these results. So remember in our flow path, we have the biocompatibility plan that you evaluated risk, and then the testing, if it's gas path or not, whatever testing you're going to do to mitigate those risks. And now you need to assess that endpoint. Um, and we, we do talk, uh, I do want to mention here the chart. So... Um, and I know I've talked about checkbox in the past, but when most people think about biocompatibility, this is what it means, right? This is what most people look at when they think of biocompatibility is, what's this chart? Where's my device? Okay, I need to do this test, this test, this test. We really need to change our thought process from where's this chart? You know, what kind of risks does this chart uh, or what testing I have to do to these are the biological endpoints that are necessary to evaluate for my device. Um, and how am I going to evaluate those, um, those endpoints? So, for example, if I, on this chart right here we're looking at, if my device is an external communicating device with blood path indirect with limited contact, I'm not just going to checkbox cytotoxicization, irritation, acute systemic toxicity, material mediated pyrogen, and hemocompatibility. What I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate the risk of my device for each one of those endpoints. Um, you know, do I know the potential for sensitization? Do I know the potential for systemic toxicity? Can I justify that through looking at the materials and processing? If I feel like I have gaps, then, I, um, then I'll have to figure out how to mitigate those. Can I mitigate that through chemistry evaluation, through a QSAR approach where I look at the structure of the compound to determine if it has some kind of potential, or am I going to have to do some kind of biological test? So that's what we're talking about here is not checkboxing. Because of that, I really would recommend that you start thinking that chemistry or material characterization is in a column at the beginning of this chart. So instead of just looking at cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation, really start in evaluating first that material slash chemical characterization of your medical device. And I want to make sure you understand that it's material slash chemical, not always chemical characterization. Because if I have a low-risk device, uh, I'm just going to a gown, a surgical gown. Um, doing a full chemical characterization may not make sense based off the risk of that medical device, but a material characterization should always be performed. Is there anything in there that is, that is known to be a sensitizer, that could be a skin irritant? Um, what chemistry is used uh, during the processing? Those questions. So really start to look at your chart as that potential.
So now we're going to talk a little bit about the new directives that came out recently. Um, and I put a lot of information in here for you as far as what I've seen in the new directives uh, and through the industry. Um, and I'm not going to cover every single one of these because uh, I feel like you can um, read them. And also a lot of these will probably be covered in the next two days of the webinar. But I am going to cover the ones that uh, would uh, essentially hit the biocompatibility endpoints, um, which is a lot of changes in how the devices are classified. So um, the first one is the uh, whole new devices are classified into class three um, and other classes. And this means that the risk of these devices have been reevaluated. So we need to remember that when we're doing a biological evaluation plan on what the risk of these devices per that individual um, notified body uh, or regulatory agency that we're looking at. But in this um, new directives, there are detailed requirements for this risk management process. And once again, I know we keep on saying risk, but I just want to kind of let you know that they are tightly um, uh, integrated in this regulation, the aspects of risk assessment. So please be aware that you will have to have a risk assessment. We are seeing personally notified bodies um, require plans, even from device manufacturers that just did the checkbox mentality. Uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we had a client that just did all the testing per the chart, submitted it to the notified body. The notified body came back and said, the, the testing, why did you do this testing? Like, justify why this testing is performed. We need to see, and they even said, a biological evaluation plan to, to evaluate the risk of the device to, to justify why you did this test. So those endpoints are not checkbox. They, you have to justify why or why not those endpoints are needed for your device. We're starting to see the same thing from the FDA. The FDA is starting to require or ask for these biological evaluation plans. Also, my, my friends that I have from the FDA always love to work with you, uh, with either through pre-subs or Q-subs. They love to have an upfront conversation with your plan. So my recommendation is to develop that plan with whatever resources you feel is appropriate to come up with the right plan. And that's your risk evaluation with your materials and your processing, your testing. Submit that to an FDA for feedback. They, I, I, I really want to stress they're not this big, scary giant out there that you don't want to talk to. They, are, they work really well with you. They sit down. They go through the plan. They talk about your approach. Uh, they really are more of a partner now than they have been before in my experience. So I highly recommend if you want to be efficient, this is the approach to do. And that goes for your notified bodies too. I forget, they yell at me for not saying that. They want to do that too. So uh, please keep that in mind. Um, there are new requirements for around single-use devices and the reprocessing, which we are going to discuss later um, in this webinar. So um, keep that in mind. So now going into the new FDA guidance document that was published last year, um, once again, we don't have time uh, to go through every single aspect. We've done webinars and white papers uh, on this in detail, but I do want to kind of cover uh, what we've seen in this new approach. So oh, real, real quickly, I want to end this uh, presentation so you can download it. I've broken them up into three categories. The first category is summary of ideas. So these are things that we've seen in the industry for a couple of years, um, but there are things that uh, maybe weren't written down in a standard place, but now we can reference them in a guidance document. The next one is uh, ways we can justify, like what is, what is the FDA needing from you to be able to justify endpoints? Um, and then the last one are things that we are relatively new to this guidance document and things that uh, could impact you as a, as a customer going forward. So some of the, like I said, I'm not going to go through all of them. We talked about uh, gas path already, that you're, if you have fluid or gas path direct, that really is important. Um, but I do want to put, the one thing I want to kind of reference here is in the chart, that everyone's familiar with, in the past, if you had something that was you know, permanent contact with the body or even some prolonged contacts, the, the biological endpoint of chronic toxicity and carcinogenicity were marked but never really evaluated. Um, you know, maybe someone would say that this is a, a silicone or whatever and there's no carcinogenicity risk, but they wouldn't really evaluate those endpoints. 
how they knew FDA guidance document reads is that every single one of those X's and circles in their chart needs to be evaluated. Either do the testing or justify why you did not. Actually, I think it's you need to evaluate why you need to do it or not. But that includes chronic toxicity and carcinogenicity. So if your device has one of those endpoints, you can no longer submit without some kind of justification around those two ends. That can be a material assessment if you have good information about the processing and materials. But a lot of the time, we, what we recommend is the extractable leachables. Uh, they are a good way to evaluate systemic toxicity and carcinogenicity along with genotoxicity without having to do these types of tests. The reason why these tests are not normally done is both the chronic, especially the chronic, or excuse me, the carcinogenicity tests are very expensive and long tests. So we, we really want to try to evaluate those through materials and, more importantly, chemical characterization with their appropriate toxicological evaluation than actually performing those endpoints. It will save you a lot of time and headache. So don't be surprised if you submit to a regulatory agency, especially the FDA, and you have these two as a biological endpoint on your, your risk evaluation, and you don't address them at all, that you will see a response asking you to address chronic toxicity and carcinogenicity. Um, some more summary of ideas. Uh, I, I'm hoping by now everybody knows that if your device has longer than 72-hour contact with the body, that you need to extract at 50 degrees C or higher. Um, unless your, your material has a glass transition phase close to 50 degrees C, then we can justify using 37. But the one thing that the new document does spell out is for cytotoxicity, uh, in the past, we only did 24-hour extractions at 37 degrees because of the L-glutamine in the cell culture media, the, the impact that heat can have on the breakdown, the aggregation of L-glutamine. But now that the FDA has done some internal experiments on this, or uh, evaluations on this, they are recommending that devices that have longer than 24-hour contact with the body, they're asking them to do 37 degrees for 72-hour extractions. Okay, this is not the incubation of the media on the cells, but the actual extraction of the medical device. If you have longer than 24 hours, you need to start evaluating those at 37 degrees uh, for 72 hours. Um, and the hemocompatibility um, is starting to change. So uh, if you have any contact with blood whatsoever, you need to start to evaluate hemolysis, complement, and thrombogenicity. Once again, when I say evaluate, I'm not saying test. Uh, for example, if I have an extra uh, corporeal circuit, uh, like a dialysis machine or something like that, it's, it's not a good way to evaluate thrombogenicity by doing a, an in vivo thrombogenicity test, like a dog thrombo test. That those two just do not mix. So you need to be smart about the device and how to evaluate these endpoints based on the risk of that device and not just checkbox uh, the, those evaluations. Some of the justification ideas. So this is where it first opens up chemistry. Uh, Dr. Jorgensen always jokes that he sat down with this document to go kind of highlight where it says chemistry in it, and he ended up stopping because it was hurting his hand because he was writing too much. Uh, that may be just because he's the wimpy guy. But besides that, chemistry is a very important part of, of how we justify tests. When you're looking at changes of medical devices, chemistry becomes a very key player in that change because we have an initial uh, ed evaluation of the, the chemical toxicity of an initial device, and now we have a change that we can evaluate the difference between those chemical profiles of the original and the changed one to really evaluate the impact of that change. That allows us to, I mean, we, the materials and the, um, and the residuals, all that plays into a uh, possible change much easier than a brand new device. But with a brand new device, the FDA in this document is allowing us to use extractable leachables, if performed correctly, in place of systemic toxicity, chronic, um, which is also systemic toxicity, genotoxicity, and carcinogenicity. So those endpoints are the ones that we can officially evaluate um, with, with chemistry. That being said, chemistry can also play a role in other endpoints. Uh, it's just a little bit of more of a scientific um, need to justify the, those endpoints. For example, a good QSAR may be able to tell you, and, and for those of you who don't know what QSAR is, it's a structural analysis of the compound. 
Um, and we can maybe evaluate the sensitization of uh, potential of a, a chemical based on its, its uh, structure analysis. So once again, in a change, that may be more um, appropriate. Or even irritation potential. Uh, there are a lot of uh, chemistry with changes uh, that we can do, uh, but these are the four endpoints that we uh, routinely perform chemistry for. Um, and this is kind of what uh, I talked about before. Uh, first off, functionality testing. Uh, most medical device manufacturers perform some type of in vivo functionality tests um, before we look at biocompatibility, trying to get the design down right. I, I really want to recommend that you work with your CRO. If you, if you are performing your functionality test outside of your normal CRO, uh, at least contact your CRO about implementing biocompatibility endpoints in those functionality tests. As long as your device is locked down enough from a material and process standpoint, we can implement a lot of these biological endpoints, risk assessments, into these functionality tests so we're not doing unnecessary animal tests. Remember the three R's for animal tests. We're really looking at ways we can reduce uh, the need for these animal uh, tests um, you know, and really try to uh, get the safety evaluation done without doing unnecessary animal tests. But we talked about a predicate sample. When I say predicate, I really mean your device that you get, you manufacture. Um, I know that when we look at 510Ks or some of these test uh, predicates, we're looking for something on the market known to be safe. But when we're looking at justifying out of biological endpoints, we're talking about a device that you know intimately. You, have, you know where the supply of the material comes from. You know the processing because those are the kind of answers that we need to justify out of test. Some of the uh, possible impacts, the cons uh, pr practitioner contact in the new guidance document, um, the FDA has put in a concern for practitioner or uh, the user of the device. Uh, this is only applies if that practitioner is, does not have appropriate clothing to protect them from the device. If they're gloved and masked and everything like that, then, then, then we're not, the risk is really low. But if they're handling your device without those protecting layers, we need to evaluate that too. Uh, they do like to use master files if they're done appropriately. We've seen a big impact from that BEP, the FDA asking us to submit those plans before, um, you know, just checkboxing um, the testing. Also, they're asking for a biological evaluation report. They even have an own attachment in their uh, document, attachment C. That doesn't mean you have to do their exact attachment C, but you should look at what information they're asking for you to provide and then make sure that information is provided to the FDA. Pyrogenicity has come into, and they have a whole other ISO or FDA guidance document around uh, pyrogenicity with the implants using the bacterial endotoxin test. Um, if you are considered an implant, and there's also good webinars out there that can help go through this, you have to evaluate pyrogenicity, not just material-mediated pyrogenicity. You have to look at bacterial endotoxin, uh, which is that LAL test that, uh, that looks for specific uh, pyrogen, which is that endotoxin. So don't think that just doing a material-mediated pyrogen will checkbox that requirement. If you're an implant, you have to just not look at material-mediated pyrogen, but you also have to look at bacterial endotoxin. Um, so, for in the past, some people address carcinogenicity by looking at their genotoxicity. Once again, remember we talked about it before, that no longer is sufficient, even though genotoxicity is one potential uh, form of carcinogenicity. There are a lot of other ways we have to look at carcinogenicity. Chemical characterization helps fill in those. Uh, and we talked about gas and fluid paths. The changes in table uh, A1. Uh, this is one of those big impacts, uh, so this is the one everyone's familiar with. You've noticed that they've added material media pyrogen uh, before. That was just kind of included in acute systemic toxicity, but now the FDA has broken it out, so that actually spells out when you have to evaluate the pyrogenicity from materials. Um, and then we talked about um, a little bit about the uh, added endpoints that are now needed to be evaluated. Um, and I also want to hit home that th with the new ISO coming out, it's very important that you start evaluating chemistry and material characterization as part of this risk assessment. Th these endpoints, uh, just consider chemistry as one of these endpoints uh, because this is going to help you save time and money. 
going forward, and it's going to help you be more in line with what the ISOs are requiring in the future. So with that, um, I think we're going to turn it back over to Chris for Q&A. All right. Thank you, Thor. And thank you, Matthew, for a great presentation. And now before we begin with today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey available on the right-hand side of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget by clicking on the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder to participate in our Q&A session, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type your question in, and then click the Submit button. Please note that we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can during the webinar today, but if we're not able to get to your question, we'll be sure to share them with our speakers who can reply to you offline after the webinar is over. So let's get on to our first question here for you. So our first question looks like, uh, is there a uh, biological risk assessment template and do other medical device companies do this through uh, FEMA? So um, there's there's a lot uh, bio biological evaluation templates. Um, obviously, we have ours that we use, um, and there's there's ones that you can find um, out there. Um, but it, and I'd be happy to share what important information we've seen. Uh, that need to be included into either a biological evaluation plan or uh, a biological evaluation report. Like I said, in the document, in the guidance document, in the appendix or attachment, there's the FDA's version of what the report should look like, but it's more important to make sure you get the right information. Um, and do other companies use this through FMEA? Um, you know, I don't see a lot of that. There may be. Uh, we don't always get to see uh, the initial plan, unless we we personally do of them. Uh, when we write the, the biological evaluation plan, uh, we use aspects, uh, but uh, there may be other ones in the comp or out there that do. But I I don't I'm not I don't see those, and so I don't think there's a big input there. All right, thank you, Thor. Uh, another question here: uh, How can we determine the uh, or yeah, how can we determine the specification limit for E&L to satisfy the safety of the product. For example, if there's a risk uh, of some, uh, or, or, excuse me, of, of there are some E&L uh, from silicon grease used during the production of passing through the final product, what is the best way to determine a specification or a limit of these uh, impurities in the final product? Yeah, this is this is something that we do all the time, and it's it's based off of ISO 10093-17, which is a, a great standard for this type of uh, evaluation for medical devices. But basically, it's that's why it's important to know the composition of these contaminants, because you can say silicone grease, but there's there's things in that silicone grease besides just silicone that uh, could have a toxicological impact. But basically. Let's say you do your extractable leachables and you get you get an idea of the components of that contaminant. Then what we do is we evaluate those based off of published literature. Uh, we also look at the the QSAR for some of those components, uh, the structure to see what the risk may be from those compounds. But ultimately, what we do is we evaluate through Dash 17. We come up with something called a margin of safety, which is just a way to evaluate how much is on your device compared to what we have proven to be safe with with other testing in animals. Um, and then that margin of safety can then be used to turn into a limit for you. So you'll know that okay, uh, this component, these, these components in my grease are toxic or everything's toxic based on the amount, but I can be under this limit and I will still be safe based on the toxicological evaluation. So you run a toxicological evaluation on the components within the grease, you find out what your margin of safety is and that helps you produce a limit that you know that you can um, be safe to have that uh, residual on the device. All right, thank you, Thor. Uh, another question here for you. Is there a list of potential hazardous chemicals? Yeah, I think that this is this is Matt Jorgensen. I think that's a great question. It's something that we come across uh, from from time to time. So the, the short answer is 
that yes, there are a few lists of hazardous chemicals uh, like the Prop 65 list, the REACH Rojas list, for example, but uh, these lists aren't really medical device specific. So really, there's a, a subset of those compounds that are really specific to medical devices. So there's uh, no, there's not a published list. Uh, we at, at Nielsen Labs certainly keep track of what compounds we see popping up for medical devices from time to time. So that we, you know, we have our, our own our own private list. But um, short answer: yes, there are lists, but no, not specific to medical devices. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the next one here is going to be: uh, Is there a requirement for statistically relevant sample sizes when performing biocomp testing? Yeah, this is Matt Jorgensen again. That's a that's another great question. So, no, there isn't a really clear um, statistical requirement for that. Not like cleaning validations, which which specifically ask for, you know, replicates across lots and and things like that. And uh, so the the way that we do this now is we try to make sure that the devices are representative of their final finished form, and uh, we anticipate that the manufacturer has good control over all of their processes, so that this is you know really representative of the devices. But there's right now no uh, specific requirement to test in replicates or across lots for biocompatibility testing. And and part of the reason is is that to run just one of these tests, especially if it's a long duration uh, animal test, can be really expensive. So if you had to go from doing you know, one expensive study to nine, it may be so uh, burdensome that it would be prohibitive. All right, thank you, Matt. The next question here for you, if uh, the supplier of a component changes, but the material is the same, is the biocompatibility test required? Yeah, so um, I know Matt wants to answer this one, but I'm, I'm taking it from him because uh, that, so um, <laughs> it really depends. Um, so I know no one likes the word depends, but um, you need to be able to prove that the materials are the same. Like I talked about, not all, not all HDPEs or not all silicones are the same, even if they are supposed to be the same, even if they say they're identical. You really need to be able to prove that the components are leaching the same comp uh, compounds. So chemistry can help with there. Uh, Matt's not a big fan of FTIR, but FTIR may be able to help you evaluate some uh, material uh, similarities, especially compared to uh, maybe some USP grade uh, materials. But leachables will be able to uh, help you identify if there are any changes with what compounds leach off those plastics. But we really need to get away from saying, I got uh, silicone from this vendor, now I got it from this vendor, it's still silicone, so I'm not, I'm not changing my device. There are differences between them. All right, Matthew, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that Thor, uh, you know, really hit the the nail on the the head there. So I, I wouldn't dare to try to add or take away anything from what Thor said. All right, fantastic. We'll move on to our next one here. Uh, it says I've been told by test uh, by test labs that material or chemical characterization can't really be used to omit the big three uh, for limited contact devices. The characterization testing is much more useful for prolonged or permanent contact devices. What's your experience? Yeah, so um, that is a very good question. So first off, I want to kind of make sure you understand that there's a difference between material and chemical. Uh, even short-term contact devices need to evaluate their materials for risk. But the chemical characterization, kind of like I talked about in my presentation, is most likely able to be used with uh, the prolonged or permanent contacting devices outside the big three. That, that being said, I don't want to say that you cannot use chemistry for some of those endpoints, depending on the material information you have. Once again, it's about risk, um, and it's, it's hard. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy to do, but there are ways we can evaluate potential sensitization if we have enough information that we, don't, we can fill in the gaps with maybe some chemistry and not have to do animals. But you can't just use chemistry to fill in the big three if you have very little material and process information. So we have been successful, but you really need to understand the, the, the risk of the materials and processes before you start to go down that route. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That looks like all the time that we have for questions for today.
Uh, I'd like to thank you both for speaking today and, and a great job with the Q&A, both for Thor and Matthew. And within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to today's event. And again, as a reminder to our audience, if we didn't get to your question today, we will be getting back to you after the program is over. This webinar is copyright 2017 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by our copyright by Nelson Laboratories. And the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. I'm Chris Keach. We'd like to thank you for attending today's course. And be sure to join us tomorrow and Thursday. And have a good day.